The president says he wants to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, early next year. But it's an open question where those prisoners would go. One possibility is a secretive installation in Colorado where more than 40 terrorists are already locked away. The government doesn't say much about this place, called the United States Penitentiary Administrative Maximum, also known as Supermax. The public had never seen the operation inside until we broadcast this story in 2007. Since President Obama mentioned Supermax in a speech about Guantanamo, we wanted to take you there again. It's a sort of 21st century Alcatraz, where convicted Al-Qaeda terrorists are force-fed and some guards worry about their own safety. Supermax is the place America sends the prisoners it wants to punish the most, a place former warden Robert Hood described as a clean version of hell. I don't know what hell is, but I do know that, that, that you know, the, the assumption would be for a free person, it would be pretty close to it. This is as close to it as we could get with our cameras. The ADX lies low and sprawling by the foothills of the Rockies, 100 miles south of Denver. There have been six wardens since it opened in 1994, but this is the first time one of them has described his experiences inside. Robert Hood ran the place from 2002 to 2005, at the end of 20 years in the Bureau of Prisons. When the Supermax job came up, you were excited about taking it. Why? Well, in our system, there's 114 prisons, and there's only one Supermax. It's like the Harvard of the system. Except the ivory towers of Harvard may be easier to get into. Supermax holds fewer than 500 prisoners. Most are here because they're too violent to be anywhere else. But this is also where America keeps convicted terrorists, more than 40 of them. You think the uh, guard towers are watching us? I know they're watching. But the Bureau of Prisons doesn't want us watching them. The general public has never seen Supermax in operation. But we found these rare, if poor quality, pictures in the files of a court case. The video shot by the staff shows a new inmate, Lawrence Clacker, a member of a prison gang, being brought in through the underground garage. Most prisoners spend up to 23 hours a day in their cells, every minute, every meal. The window in their cell is blocked, so they can't see the mountains. The inmates can watch a 12-inch black and white television or read books to pass the time. And if they behave, they may get limited exercise in a one-man recreation pen. This was the life that terrorist Richard Reed saw when he was brought into Supermax. Tell me about when he came in. We're escorting him down, and his eyes are getting bigger and bigger. He's realizing, I'm in trouble. Shortly after 9-11, it was Reed who tried to blow up an airliner with a bomb in his shoe. Reed didn't impress you? No. A leader or a follower? Definitely, in my opinion, a follower. I think he would jump off the top of the Empire State Building if, you, if he thought it was for the right cause. We've learned that Reed, seen here in his cell, is in a special wing for terrorists called H-Unit, Others include Zacharias Moussaoui, who wanted to be one of the 9-11 hijackers, and Wadi El Hajj, Osama bin Laden's former private secretary. Another terrorist in Supermax is Ramzi Youssef, the leader of the first World Trade Center attack in 1993. What did you make of him? The most interesting inmate in my career. I was surprised that he was extremely respectful, prayed every, you know, almost on the hour. Yusuf has been living in ADX for 11 years, sacrificing to live by his own code. Something as simple as uh, recreating, he would have to strip search, be strip searched to go recreate. He chose not to do that because of his belief that it'd be inappropriate for us to show uh, his body or see his body. And so he stays in the cell? Never been out, to my knowledge. Eight years after Yusuf's World Trade Center attack came 9-11, and the inmates saw it on the TVs in their cells. We had a lot of them jump up and down, you know, scream and yell and clap, and, and they were very excited. Barbara Batulis is a corrections officer speaking to us as head of the officers' union. She is the only current Supermax employee 
who would sit down for an interview. I'm curious about the Islamist extremists, the terrorists in the prison. As a group, what are they like? How do they behave? Um, a lot of them behave self-righteously, uh, very needy, but me being a female, I think that's part of me dealing with them also. Wait, wait, you said they're needy? Some of them are. What do you mean by that? <laughs> they want more than what they have coming. Like what? Um, just your basics. They want extra toilet paper or extra paper, writing paper, extra envelopes. And if you can't give them, they want to see a supervisor right then and there. And that doesn't always happen. There have been concessions to the Islamic terrorists. We got a hold of the commissary list and we found prayer rugs for $18 and a menu with no pork. But still, they're ordered around by female guards and that really upsets them. A terrorist inmate threatened to kill my family because I was doing my job. I, I wonder, do the corrections officers prefer to work elsewhere in the prison? Do they prefer to work with with the gangbangers and the murderers as I opposed do. to the... Really? I do. <laughs> because I am a female. You can feel it. Oh, yes. Yes, it's very obvious. I mean, they just look at you with, with sheer disdain. Turns out that sheer disdain doesn't end there. We're told that there have been frequent hunger strikes among the Islamic terrorist inmates inside Supermax, and to keep the inmates alive, there are often force feedings. That's when an inmate is restrained and liquid nourishment is poured down a tube in his nose. We're told that there have been a dozen hunger strikers and one of them used to be Osama bin Laden's secretary. Former warden Robert Hood told us that he supervised many of these feedings. I probably conducted, authorized, conducted 350, maybe 400 of involuntary feedings. Not 350 or 400? Not individuals because you can have one person three meals a day for, you know, two months. That adds up. Bureau of Prisons records that we have seen show that there have been as many as 900 of what the Bureau calls involuntary feedings of terrorists in H unit since 2001. Why did they stop eating? What was the complaint? It was conditions of confinement. Some of the conditions that they object to are outlined in this document. Inmates get letters only from people approved by the prison, and they get one monitored phone call a month for 15 minutes. As strict as that seems, we're told that there is an even higher level of confinement, sort of an ultramax inside supermax. It's a group of cells where there is virtually no human contact, not even with the guards, and there are only two prisoners who are considered so dangerous that they're locked in this place that's known as Range 13. One of them is Tommy Silverstein, who killed a prison guard, and the other is World Trade Center bomber Ramsey Youssef. Warden Hood says Youssef is on Range 13 for just one reason. He has that Charlie Manson look. Charlie Manson look? He just has the eyes, he has, the, he has, a, a, he has some charisma about him. He's in uniform but you know that there's a powerful person that you're looking at. You didn't want him in a place where he could give anybody any orders. True. We're told something strange is happening with Yusuf. He now insists that he has renounced Islam and converted to Christianity. He's even begun leaving his cell for exercise. Warden Hood left before all this happened, but still, he doesn't buy it. He's playing a game with someone. If he's doing that, he's doing it for the reaction. He's doing it for whatever. He is the real deal. There are plenty of other real deals at Supermax. They're the all-stars of infamy. There's Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, Oklahoma City bombers Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh before McVeigh was executed, and Robert Hansen, the FBI supervisor turned Soviet spy. Olympic Park bomber Eric Rudolph is here. So are the Al-Qaeda terrorists who bombed the U.S. embassies in Africa. Mob informant Sammy the Bull Gravano has been here. We weren't allowed any interviews with prisoners in Supermax, but we did find Garrett Linderman, an inmate who actually got out. You were one of the least famous people in the whole place. In the whole prison. <laughs> Linderman had been in another prison for robbery until his cellmate there was found stabbed to death. Linderman wasn't tried for the murder, but they transferred him to the ADX or Supermax. 
He was released, then robbed a bank, and we found him here in Washington State. How is the ADX different than other lockups you've been in? Your connections to the outside, your family, through phone calls, visits, all those are, uh, all those are pretty much stopped at the ADX. There's no comparison. You talked about the brutality of isolation. What do you mean by that? It breaks down the human spirit. It breaks down um, the human psyche. It breaks your mind. What does the world look like to a Supermax inmate? With his own pictures, Linderman gave us a tour of his former 7 by 12 foot cell. This is the shower, the concrete bed, or mattress. And this is the window with the red concrete bricks behind it. It's the uh, only prison I've ever heard of that allows you to take a picture in your cell. I guess they're quite confident in their security. Confident, but there has been trouble like this. Until 2005, some general population inmates were allowed in the rec yard together, and there were occasional fights. In the 14 years since it's been open, two inmates have been murdered. And remember Clacker, the inmate you saw being brought into the Supermax? He later killed himself, one of four prisoners who've committed suicide. There remains another concern for safety today. Barbara Batulis, who is the head of the officers' union, told us that the prison is dangerously understaffed, with more than a quarter of the staff jobs unfilled. We've been told that entire housing units that house notorious gang members and terrorists have gone uncovered and have been monitored by officers elsewhere in the prison during these staff shortages. Is that true? Um, I can't really say anything about that. That's internal security and I can't talk about that. Um, I, can, I can tell you that we are very short staffed. What's at stake? Lives. I firmly believe staffed lives are at stake. It's not just her opinion. In 2006, a federal arbitration judge agreed that the prison was short staffed and said that assaults and threats from inmates were increasing. The current Supermax warden met with us briefly and told us the staffing shortage is overblown by the union, but he wouldn't appear on camera. In fact, no one at the Federal Bureau of Prisons would sit down for an interview. Supermax remains the least known prison in America. I've heard the ADX described as a clean version of hell. The perfection of isolation uh, painted pretty. The perfection of isolation, is that the way it felt to you? Yeah, they've perfected it there. There has been a lot of talk about criminal justice reform in America, and it would be hard to find a place more in need of reform than Rikers Island, the most important jail in New York City. Located in the middle of the East River, Rikers holds about 10,000 inmates. It's a volatile mix. Some have been convicted of minor crimes, but as many as 80% are awaiting trial. Many are there because they can't make bail. And in a trend that reflects a growing national problem, Rikers holds a rising number of mentally ill inmates. The mentally ill now make up more than 40% of the population. Correction officers are not adequately trained to deal with this population. The result is a disturbing pattern of neglect and excessive force that is the focus of our story tonight. It has led the U.S. Attorney, Preet Bharara, to intervene. I mean, what you really have, we found, was a, was a culture of violence on top of a code of silence, and that is a deadly combination, and I mean that literally, as we found in, in a number of cases, uh, that we have brought in connection with Rikers Island. Concerned by those deaths and a stream of alarming reports about Rikers Island, Preet Bharara, who is the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, launched a two-year investigation into the jail complex. We found in an alarming number of cases there was no discipline with respect to officers at all. That You had an officer who had dozens of complaints against him uh, and was never disciplined once or maybe just one time. 
And, and that's something that has to change. People have to understand that there are consequences for their actions, not just the inmates, but the, the officers as well. How long has this been going on? Years and years, too long. Rikers is a 400-acre island just off the tarmac of LaGuardia Airport in the shadows of Manhattan skyscrapers. One bridge leads in and out. It's surrounded by its own moat. The inmate population has come down dramatically from a high of 20,000 to 10,000. But despite the decrease, city data shows violence has gone up over the last decade. Because of the U.S. Attorney's findings, an unusual collaboration was formed. Barrara, the prosecutor, teamed up with plaintiff's lawyers, the Legal Aid Society, and private attorney Jonathan Abadie in a class action lawsuit on behalf of a dozen Rikers inmates. The number of facial fractures, of traumatic brain injury, of broken bones, of serious physical injury is just out of control. Compounding the problems at Rikers, is that increase in the number of mentally ill inmates. And that just complicates issues relating to violence and issues relating to care and issues relating to discipline. Um, so it's a problem. What was captured on this video obtained by 60 Minutes helps illustrate what U.S. Attorney Barrara is talking about. It has not been seen in public before. Bradley Ballard, who was schizophrenic and diabetic, was brought to Rikers in 2013 on charges of violating parole for an assault conviction. In the video, he was observed twisting his shirt into a phallic symbol and making lewd gestures, and then was taken back to his cell according to an investigation by the New York State Commission of Correction. He was placed in the functional equivalent of solitary confinement. They put him in a cell, they locked the cell, and they basically threw away the key. Abadie represents Ballard's family in a pending wrongful death suit against the city. The commission's report found that Ballard was locked in his cell for six days prior to his death and was denied access to his life-supporting prescription medications, and that day after day, officers, supervisors, and clinicians walked by, observed his deteriorating state, but failed to help him. After repeated floodings of Ballard's toilet, a maintenance worker turned off the water running into Ballard's cell. The report found that Ballard was lying in his own waste. He's spraying a deodorizer? Yes, um, the reports are that Corrections officers were bringing aerosol cans from home because the stench was so bad coming from that cell. Here, an inmate who delivered a food tray pulled his shirt up over his nose. The report found the videotape indicated Ballard's cell was grossly unsanitary. Finally, on the sixth day, medical workers were called. According to the report, an officer asked Ballard if he could get up on his own. I need help, Ballard said. Inmate workers carried him out of his cell and put him on a gurney. Records show Ballard went into cardiac arrest soon after. He died hours later. They watched him languish for seven days as he died, and they did nothing. It was the functional equivalent of torture. They killed him. The city's medical examiner declared Ballard's death a homicide, according to the commission report. It called Ballard's medical and custodial treatment from the time he entered Rikers so incompetent and inadequate as to shock the conscience. The Department of Correction issued a statement that it adjusted its practices to ensure that a similar tragedy doesn't happen again. But to this day, no criminal charges have been filed against any of the officers, supervisors, or health workers involved. It's impossible to know if anyone stepped forward, but if they did, it wasn't enough to help Bradley Ballard. That's inhumane, in my opinion. That, that should never have happened. Norman Seabrook is president of the union that represents the correction officers, but not the higher-ranking supervisors. We showed him the Ballard video. Who's responsible? The supervisor. What about your officers? The officers followed the instructions of the supervisor. In another incident captured on surveillance video, inmate Jose Batista tried to hang himself. He had been arrested on domestic charges and was awaiting trial. He couldn't post the $250 bail. When he jumped up suddenly, officers beat him so severely he suffered a perforated bowel and needed emergency surgery, according to case records. 
Bautista's case was one of 129 serious injuries over an 11-month period documented in a revealing report by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that was intended for internal use only, but 60 Minutes managed to get a copy. The report found 77% of the injuries involved mentally ill inmates, and their injuries were severe enough to require care beyond the capacity of jail medical doctors. You could take a third of the 77% and say that, okay, it was the inmate who was just being violent and needed to be subdued. But 77% is, I think, tells the story. It's a problem. Dr. Daniel Selling, who is now in private practice, was the executive director of mental health at Rikers for five years until he left in 2014. Is it fair to say that Rikers is a mental institution? Sure, it's probably one of the largest mental institutions in the nation, if not the largest. Can you tell me about the case of Bradley Ballard? What does that say about how things work on Rikers? It's probably the worst case um, that I've experienced, been a part of. That was a a case in which all systems failed. Selling said the staff of the private medical contractor failed to do the required daily rounds and never informed him about Ballard's deteriorating condition. The city's contract with the private medical firm was not renewed. Bradley Ballard is not the only mentally ill inmate to have died in custody in recent years. In 2014, U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara filed the first criminal civil rights case in a decade against a Rikers officer or supervisor in connection with the poisoning of mentally ill inmate Jason Echeverria, who died after ingesting toxic soap while in solitary confinement. As seen in this video that was entered into evidence, Echeverria, a robbery suspect who was also awaiting trial, was escorted to a cell where he swallowed the toxic soap that was given to him for cleaning his cell. His father, Ramon, told us he believes he ate the soap in a desperate effort to get out of solitary confinement. My son was screaming because he was burning up inside. He's dying. He's dying. A few hours later, according to court documents, correction officer Raymond Castro alerted unit supervisor Captain Terrence Pendergrass that Echeverria needed medical attention. According to Castro's testimony, Captain Pendergrass said, don't call me if you have live breathing bodies. Only call me if you need a cell extraction or if you have a dead body. Another correction officer, Angel Lazarte, testified as to what happened next. A pharmacy technician on her rounds said Echeverria could die. He then approached Pendergrass, and Pendergrass told him to write an injury report. You can see on the tape, Pendergrass then went to look into Echeverria's cell himself. He returned and interrupted the writing of the report. Pendergrass led Lazarte away from the desk. After they talked, Lazarte pocketed the report. According to court records, the report was never filed. Echeverria was discovered dead the next morning. The medical examiner ruled his death a homicide due to neglect and denial of medical care. He saw him, he was, he was in pain and everything. Why couldn't you just call an ambulance for him? Okay, he's a prisoner, he's an inmate. He's a human being. He's a human being. It both breaks your heart and it makes your blood boil. Because you're thinking to yourself, here's somebody who had responsibility for making sure that peace was enforced, but also responsible for the safety and protection of those under his charge. And that report was never filed. You know, one of the conclusions we found in our investigation was that in case after case after case, sometimes you would have individuals who would witness things and they would get together and they would coach each other into what their response should be, which makes it very difficult to hold anyone accountable. That culture you're describing seems so entrenched that the officers felt almost comfortable behaving like that even with the cameras running. I was just, what, what, is, what does that say to you about that culture? Yeah, it says that the culture is broken. It says that the institution is broken. Captain Pendergrass was convicted in December 2014. A jury found that Pendergrass violated Jason Echeverria's constitutional rights by deliberately ignoring his pleas for help and depriving him of urgent medical care, leaving Echeverria to die alone in his cell. 
Pendergrass was sentenced to five years in prison. Officers Castro and Lazarte have since been fired. Absolutely. Union President Norman Seabrook said it's his officers that. don't have the training to deal with mentally ill inmates like Jason Echeverria and Bradley Ballard. Your men are not trained. And women. No, they're not Your trained. Your men and women are not trained to deal with mental illness. Not at all. We asked Norman Seabrook about the internal report showing the vast majority of excessive force cases involving mentally ill inmates. At the end of the day, shouldn't the question be, why didn't these individuals receive their medication so that they wouldn't attack a correction officer? If you're talking about an inmate that has a mental health problem, then certainly something set this person off. Seabrook says it's not just an issue of the mentally ill. Rikers is a dangerous place, and many of his officers are assaulted every year. Seabrook wanted to show us the conditions his officers have to contend with. But when he took us out to Rikers, Department of Corrections staffers stopped us from going inside with our cameras to see the problem Seabrook is talking about. This is as far as we got, walking around the perimeter of one of the buildings with him. We wanted to talk to the commissioner of the correction department about the problems at Rikers, but our three scheduled interviews all were postponed. The city recently initiated a number of policy changes, like installing more cameras and reducing the use of solitary confinement a federal monitor was appointed to ensure the reforms are implemented. U.S. Attorney Barrara is going to hold the city to it. Is there a decrease in violence? You know, it remains to be seen how much that de decrease will be over time. I think the training will take some time and is happening as we speak. It's taken some time to build up this culture of violence. Yes, it has. How long do you think it will take to unravel it? I'm not gonna put a clock on it, but I will say that we're, we're impatient people and we like to see results, that's why we got involved in the first place. The United States federal prison system has 157,000 inmates in its custody, it locks up some of the most dangerous and high-profile criminals in the world. Serial killers and terrorists are among those inside its 122 prisons, which include supermax penitentiaries and minimum security camps. The cost to American taxpayers is more than $8 billion a year. Tonight, we will take you inside the Federal Bureau of Prisons, an agency in crisis. A series of government investigations has found the Bureau's workforce is dangerously understaffed, and inside its women's prisons, there is an alarming pattern of abuse. Colette Peters is in charge of fixing the Bureau of Prisons. She's the sixth director in six years. This is Aliceville, a low-security women's prison in rural Alabama where more than 1,400 inmates are serving time. People drive past prisons every day. Yeah, they're terrified of them. Or they don't think about them at all, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like this forgotten zone. I don't want people to forget about this place. I want Colette Peters became that. director of the Bureau of Prisons in August 2022. After a 20-year career in corrections, she's built a reputation as a reformer. I love your poster. We are all stronger than we think, aren't we? Before becoming director, she was credited with shaping Oregon's state prison system by prioritizing staff mental health support and advocating for the compassionate treatment of inmates. I have this very early memory in kindergarten where an individual came in with a pocket knife and was marched to the principal's office. And I just remember in that moment saying, I want to help him. Many people in your custody are there because of horrific crimes. Why do they deserve compassion? Because 95% of them are gonna come back to our community someday. And I want them to be productive, tax-paying citizens who no longer commit crimes. But the Bureau of Prisons is so inadequately staffed, it is struggling to fulfill its mission, rehabilitating inmates and keeping its prisons safe. Government watchdogs have documented disrepair in all of its institutions, requiring more than $2 billion in fixes. And employees rank the Bureau of Prisons the worst place to work in the federal government. It's very rare for the media to be allowed inside a federal prison. Why are we here? 
I truly believe in transparency. Are we perfect? No. Do we have issues we need to resolve? Absolutely. But I want people to see the good stuff. We toured Aliceville with Director Peters and saw where inmates live, learn new trades, and work. On this day, sewing sleeping bags for the military, a coveted job because it pays $1.15 an hour. You ladies are amazing. And when you leave here, you're going to be incredible. This ceremony is for inmates graduating from a faith-based program, preparing them for life on the outside by connecting them with community leaders and teaching them life skills like anger management. But the reality is nearly half of federal inmates will end up back behind bars or arrested within three years of getting out. A lot of those faces in there who have so much promise and hope today could end up right back in here. Yeah, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do to dial down that recidivism rate. We have to send fewer people to prison for shorter periods of time. And then when they're here, do things like this. You also have a major staffing issue and people can't get these classes right. that they need. Staffing was a problem before the pandemic. And so that re those recruitment efforts and those retention efforts have gotten hard. How many correctional officers do you need on staff to get you out of this staffing crisis? So we hope to have that real number for uh, you and the public um, very soon. That seems like a critical number. How was that not on your desk when you took this job on day one and, and still not there a year later? So the good news is this was a problem the Bureau was trying to solve before I got here, and we're in the process of solving it. Director Peters says she expects to have the number of officers needed by October more than two years after taking office. But Shane Fozzie, the recently retired president of the Federal Prison Employees Union, says he knows what that number is now. We're short about 8,000 positions nationwide. How bad is it? It results in one of us losing our lives. And it's that bad. We can't continue with this course. By the union's count, the Bureau of Prisons is down about 40% of the correctional officers it needs. The less supervision you have, the more bad things happen. Misconduct increases, violence increases. And because there are not enough officers, the Bureau relies on other prison staff to step in. It's a controversial practice called augmentation. Teachers, nurses, doctors, food service people, the people that maintain facilities. They're doing what now? They're in a housing unit supervising offenders. Do they have training in that? They do. But I can tell you, I'm no better a plumber than they are a correctional officer. I can walk into a housing unit and tell you something's right or something's wrong. You develop that over years of experience. Let's break this down. We are talking about HVAC repairmen and accountants who are now guarding inmates. That doesn't sound safe. So it is. So they have the exact same training as the correctional officers. Now, what I will say is augmentation should only be used in the short term. We've used this now to solve a long-term retention and recruitment problem, and that isn't right. On this point, the union and management agree. Prison staff, like teachers and doctors, need to be able to do their jobs so that inmates don't lose access to critical services and programs. Their buzz phrase is, everybody's a correctional officer first. That sounds good on paper, but if you take the teacher out of the classroom and nobody's teaching the offender the skills to go back out to society, we're just back to warehousing people. While we walked the halls of Aliceville, classrooms were packed, but several inmates told us that much of what we saw on our tour was staged. Am I getting a real look at what life is like in here today? Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. Mm -mm. No, definitely Absolutely. not. The no. staff is very disrespectful here. Even though we made mistakes, um, when we're out here, we're not treated with respect. Do um, you feel safe here? Um, sometimes. I mean, prison is prison. You feel what I'm saying? Tell me about staffing. They're short staffed all the time. There's times where you don't know if you're going to be able to go outside because somebody didn't come to work. And if you were to speak up about some of these issues that you're telling me about, what would happen? You're going to the yeah, shoe. The shoe, short for special housing unit, is the jail inside a prison, where inmates are segregated from the general population and seldom let outside of their cells. Make you nervous to talk to me right now? 
A little bit. The director is coming today. What does she need to know about Aliceville? Fix it. We need more education, more like opportunity to grow and rehabilitate because we don't have that here. I've talked to a handful of inmates here today and they say, look, you're getting a cleaned up version of what life is really like. I've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, so I can see when things have been swept under the rug, if you will, I'm not naive. And when anybody comes to your house, you clean it up. Of all the issues plaguing the Bureau of Prisons, perhaps none is more disturbing than the rampant sexual abuse of female inmates by the male officers who are supposed to protect them. Women are housed in nearly a quarter of federal prisons, and a 2022 Senate investigation found that Bureau staff have sexually abused female prisoners in at least two-thirds of those facilities over the past decade. Aliceville is no exception. Three officers have been convicted of sexual abuse since 2020, including one who pleaded guilty earlier this month. Those are just the cases that we know about. How does this keep happening? You can't predict human behavior. But what I can tell you is the things that we're putting in place to manage to that misconduct, I think are the right things and sending a clear message that this type of behavior is egregious, horrendous, and unexcusable. But female inmates at a women's prison in Northern California accused Director Peters and the Bureau of Prisons of failing to protect them. Its official name is Federal Correctional Institution Dublin, but it's known by inmates and staff as the Rape Club. Seven Dublin officers, including the warden and the chaplain, have been convicted of sexually abusing nearly two dozen inmates from 2018 to 2021. And this past August, eight inmates filed suit, claiming sexual abuse continues to this day. These are mothers, their daughters, their sisters, Tess Korth worked as a correctional officer at Dublin for 25 years. She resigned in 2022 after she says she was retaliated against for whistleblowing. They train us in the red flags to look for. And then when we report, hey, they're, every red flag this guy meets, you need to go deal with this. They don't do anything. What was the chaplain doing that made you suspicious? One time I came in on a weekend. He didn't know I was there. His office was dark, and he had an inmate in there with him, and I don't know what they were doing. That's a red flag. Oh, definitely. Former Officer Korth says she reported the chaplain and other officers who she suspected of sexually abusing inmates to an internal affairs investigator, but was ignored for years until federal investigators stepped in. What happened to the officers that you accused? Most of them have been or in the process of being convicted, and a lot of them are in, named in lawsuits right now. How does that make you feel? Good. The Bureau of Prisons has a backlog of nearly 8,000 open misconduct investigations, hundreds of which contain allegations of sexual abuse. Director Peters hired more staff to tackle the backlog, but she says it will take two years to clear those cases. In response to the Dublin lawsuit, Bureau of Prisons lawyers say inmates' claims have been investigated and that no threat remains. We've done a tremendous job in the last year rebuilding that culture and creating a uh, institution that is more safe, where individuals feel comfortable coming forward and reporting claims. You just used the phrase tremendous job in Dublin. Eight inmates have filed a class action lawsuit and they've got testimony from more than 40 current and former Dublin inmates who say that the abuse is ongoing. That means the, the process is working, that they have the ability to come forward. They have the right to bring that class action lawsuit together. These Dublin inmates say that they are facing retaliation for speaking out. I have been very clear that retaliation will not be stood on my watch. And so when allegations of retaliation come forward, they are investigated and we will hold those people accountable. It's one thing for you to say that retaliation is not tolerated, but it sounds like it's actually still happening. Again, I would say those are allegations. Um, I would like to be more grounded in fact around proven retaliation. The fact is that an additional 19 staff members have been accused of abusing inmates. The Bureau says those staff members have been put on leave, new management has been brought in, and there are now working security cameras in areas where inmates were abused. What are these victims owed? <sighs> to have individuals who are in our care, who rely on us for their 
safety and security and to have that be violated, I don't know that you can bring anything uh, that, that would undo that wrong. What about an apology? The victims in Dublin say they've never received an apology. Well, I will tell you um, that is our mission to keep them safe. That is our job. Is your job to apologize for what happened in Dublin? I don't know that my job is to apologize. Um, is it heartbreaking and horrendous to have something like that happen uh, when you are proud of your profession as a corrections professional? Absolutely. In addition to the lawsuit filed this past August, more than 45 current and former Dublin inmates have filed lawsuits alleging sexual abuse by Bureau of Prisons staff. Mohamedou Salahi was set free by the United States and sent to his home country of Mauritania last October after nearly 14 years as prisoner 760 in Guantanamo Bay. Improbably, while fighting for his own release, he taught himself English, wrote a best-selling book about his life in American custody and became good friends with some of his guards, one of whom you'll hear from tonight. Salahi spent about one third of his life at Guantanamo, and his book offered an unprecedented look inside the prison. Though it includes descriptions of torture, it can be funny at times, and we discovered that in person, Salahi has a keen sense of humour. Six weeks after he was released from Guantanamo, we went to Northwest Africa to meet him. What's it like losing all control over your life? It sucks. <laughs> it's very challenging. I don't know how to describe it in words, but you feel like humiliation. You feel self-pity. You feel like uh, uh, panic. <laughs> I didn't have a plan. I was learning as I was going. Mohamedou Salahi is once again adapting to unfamiliar surroundings, this time home and freedom. To learn how he went from here to Guantanamo and back again, we travelled to the Islamic Republic of Mauritania. It's a tribal and deeply religious nation of nearly four million people, where the Sahara Desert meets the sea. About the size of Texas and New Mexico combined, the country is due east of Cuba, separated from Salahi's old prison home by the width of the Atlantic. You know what's there? Yes. Guantanamo. Guantanamo Bay. About 3,800 miles in yes. that direction. I say goodbye. Hope never to see you again. Before we explain how Salahi ended up in Guantanamo in the first place, we'll tell you how a talent for languages helped him survive there. How much English did you speak when you landed in Guantanamo? Almost none. In the office of his new apartment in Mauritania, Mohamedou Salahi showed us how he learned English in Guantanamo. He reads and writes his fourth language with some help from the US Navy. Where did you get those glasses? Glasses. I got from Navy Hospital in Guantanamo Bay. Thank you, doctors. And they had choices, and I took the ugliest one. You, you chose? As a sign of protest. He was his own teacher in Guantanamo, soaking up new vocabulary wherever he could. I'm letting you now into my world. Okay, this is how I learned the English language. This is the original. So you would, what, hear something and write it down? Hear something, write it down and ask. And then ask a guard. Ask a guard or an interrogator. How do you spell Whomever that? I meet. Yeah. To chortle. It's a, it's a very, it's a very good Snorting word. To chortle. Chortle. <laughs> Skyscraper, riot, suicide. You were just working on building your vocabulary. So what I do, I take this, and then I just go in my cell back and forth, and memorizing everything, every day. She Did threaded her fingers through that thick mane of exquisitely dyed hair. Yes. What were you reading? I think that was Yaya's sisterhood. In 2005, three years after he arrived at Guantanamo, Salahi used his new language skills to demand his immediate release. He hand-wrote his own petition for a writ of habeas corpus, 
a legal document challenging the US government's right to imprison him. He also began a correspondence with his American lawyers that became the Guantanamo Diary. It's been translated into 27 different languages, but it took seven years for his legal team to convince the government to allow its publication, and they only permitted a heavily censored version. It's like was I was shouting in the dark for years, then I saw a very small hole that I could shout through, which was my lawyer. I don't know if you've seen this before. It is the original copy of the review of your book okay. in the New York Times. Have you seen it before? Never. First time. <laughs> you were locked in a prison with so little contact with the outside world. And meanwhile, your work was being discussed. That shows the greatness of American people, not the, my greatness, because American people believe in justice and they decided to give me a forum, to give me a voice. By 2004, the US government regarded him as a cooperative prisoner, so Salahi was living in a special segregated hut. He had access to books, movies and his own vegetable garden, but he was still a prisoner struggling with solitude 4,000 miles from home. You can bet your bottom dollar that I was lonely. I mean, in the book, you describe the guards as your family. Yes. Is that true? They really, a lot of them treated me as, one, as a brother. We found one of Salahi's former guards who asked us to disguise his appearance and withhold his name. He had security concerns because of his work at Guantanamo. How long did you guard him for? Ten months. And when was that, the first time you met him? In July of 2004. Any first impressions? Uh, just that he wasn't this horrible terrorist that, you know, I, I was expecting to go guard, you know, that I was told it was everybody there is the worst of the worst, and this guy comes out with a smile on his face. It, so straight away you started thinking, this is not what I was expecting. I felt something was off. Definitely. You didn't think he was going to harm you? No, if he wanted to. I mean, there are times where we slept while he was sleeping and his door was open and like, if, if he wanted to kill us, he could have. But you were pretty sure he wasn't going to do that? Yeah, I had no issues. You trusted him? Definitely. He was very shocked because he told me, they told him this is the worst of the worst. And I wasn't very open to the guards because I was afraid of them. But he kept poking me until we opened up to each other. It was a very good time with him. We'd play Monopoly or a lot of rummy, watch movies like over and over, and uh, yeah, just hanging out with us. We heard there was one film in particular that you guys watched over and over. The Big Lebowski, like nonstop. Like he could quote it like word for word, like a, a giant por portion of the movie. It was hilarious. I mean, I was struck by that. What's interesting about the Big Lebowski is they get the wrong guy. Yes. You got the wrong guy. I'm the dude, man. I'm not your guy. <laughs> you played a role in Mohamedou Salahi's release. You wrote a letter to Correct. the review board that decided on whether he, he would finally be released. Mm -hmm. um, I think, is that the letter there? That is. Yeah. That is. I just want to read you a section of it. You said, Based on my interactions with Mr. Salahi while in Guantanamo, I would be pleased to welcome him into my home. Based on my interactions, I do not have safety concerns if I were to do so. I would like the opportunity to eventually see him again. For sure, that's totally honest. Was that your philosophy? Last year, when the military's periodic review board finally cleared him to go home, Salahi says his guards and interrogators seemed even happier than he was including the officer in charge. She was smiling, the most beautiful smile I've ever seen in my life. He said, you know you're leaving? I said, no, I, I, I didn't know. What were you feeling? I was feeling happy, but I, I always learned not to over-celebrate because so many people received clearance, but they lingered in prison for so many years, including to this day. 
you didn't want to jinx it. I never heard jinx it, but I presume it's the right word here. <laughs> he says he was flown home from Guantanamo Bay the same way he arrived, shackled and blindfolded. Strapped on a chair too. It's very painful. More than 10 hours in a chair. Did you ask, why are you doing this to me? Why in the world should I ask any question? I didn't want them to change their mind. I said, do whatever you got to do. I need to go home and go home quick. Assalamu alaikum. Salahi's long road to Guantanamo began not with the war on terror, <laughs> but with another war covered here on 60 Minutes. In 1988, correspondent Harry Reasoner and producer George Kreil travelled to Afghanistan to tell the tale of a congressman from Texas named Charlie Wilson. Okay. Yeah. Right. He persuaded the U.S. to arm the Mujahideen, a band of holy warriors who were fighting the Soviet Union and their communist allies. A few years later, Salahi, who was studying in Germany, decided, along with thousands of other Muslim men from around the world, to join the battle against the communists. This was a big coalition, including my country and your country. What made you decide to go to Afghanistan as a young man? I saw those horrific pictures of people, children being gassed. And I said, I want to do something. Then that's when I decided to travel. And I took a visa and then I went there twice. You thought you were fighting for a just cause? Yes, I was sure then. I did not know. Today I know. In Afghanistan, Salahi was trained to fight, not by the Afghans, but by a group of foreign fighters dedicated to the cause. At the time, they were led by a young, charismatic leader called Osama bin Laden. Allah. Salahi says he left Afghanistan the second time without ever firing a shot in battle. When I saw that the Afghanis were butchering each other, I was completely disgusted. The first time you, you went to Afghanistan, what did your family think? They thought I was a nitwit. A nitwit? Yes. I should never have gone to Afghanistan. I had a scholarship that many people in the whole world dream to have. And what I did, I threw everything away and I went to Afghanistan. This is the definition of a nitwit. And when you left Afghanistan for the second time, did you still consider yourself a member of Al-Qaeda? Absolutely not. I cut all my ties with the organization. To me, I joined for the sake of participating in jihad in Afghanistan. Jihad in Afghanistan turned into a quagmire. I did not want to be part of a civil war. And I went back. Thank God I resumed my studies. I finished college and I work to help my family. Salahi denies he ever had anything to do with terrorism, but he doesn't deny that some of his friends were still members of Al-Qaeda. He also had a cousin who was a spiritual advisor to Osama bin Laden. That was really the trouble. That's where the trouble began. One day in 1999, he got a phone call from that cousin, a man known as Abu Hafs. And if you had known at the time that he was calling you, from bin Laden's satellite phone. I would have burned his house down. Would you have taken the call? Absolutely not. But looking back, it's better that I took it, that the people who are listening know what I was talking about. That's where the trouble started, honestly. After 9-11, the United States government made catching Salahi a priority. And the Mauritanians were happy to help their powerful ally. On November 20th, 2001, secret police knocked on the door of his mother's house. He followed them back to their station, driving his own car. Is it over here? That's the car. 15 years later, it still sits in the exact right place where he parked it. Wow, it's a bit of a wreck. Yes, yes. It's the right license plate? This is my license it's plate. It's yours? Yes. It's kaput. After eight days in a Mauritanian jail, his government handed him over to the CIA, who flew him to a prison in Jordan where he spent eight months. 
US agents then took him to Bagram Air Base near Kabul, Afghanistan. After two weeks there, he was put on a military transport plane for the long trip to Cuba. At what point did it hit you in the stomach? <laughs> I'm really in a jam here. It, it doesn't, actually. You, you would be surprised. If there is no hope, there is no life. In Guantanamo, Mohamedou Salahi's special interrogation plan was personally approved by Secretary of Defence Donald Rumsfeld. The treatment he received has since been outlawed. In a moment, Salahi describes what happened to him. Of the nearly 800 men who've been incarcerated at some point in Guantanamo Bay, prisoner 760, Mohamedou Salahi, was the only one to detail his treatment there in a book that came out while he was still detained in the prison. Published in 2015, it is a unique first-person account of life in Guantanamo and America's now outlawed enhanced interrogation program. When Salahi arrived at the prison, his time spent in Afghanistan in the early 1990s and connections to al-Qaeda made him a top priority for US intelligence. We begin the second part of our story by asking Salahi the same questions his interrogators asked him over and over. Did you meet any of the 9-11 hijackers? No. Did you have any prior knowledge of the 9-11 attacks? Absolutely none whatsoever. And when you saw on television those attacks, what did you think? It was heartbreaking, you know, knowing that those people, just like my family, children, men, women, just regular people who went to their war. They didn't do anything to anyone. But they were, yet they were killed in cold blood. When you discovered that it was the work of Al-Qaeda, what did you think? I thought, this is evil. Thank God that I left Afghanistan so many years. Living freely in his home country of Mauritania, Salahi is working on a new edition of his book, Guantanamo Diary, that fills in some of the blanks put in by the US government. Salahi arrived in Guantanamo in August 2002. For several months, he was interrogated by the FBI. In 2003, the military began subjecting him to so-called enhanced interrogation that included both physical and psychological abuse. They said... His they uncensored well. story, which you're about to hear, is supported by several reports and investigations from Congress and the Departments of Justice and Defence. They had plans, very careful thoughts, plans. He says those plans began when he was moved to a special cell in the India Block section of the prison, a place he nicknamed the Fridge. Why the Fridge? Yeah, it's a very small holding cell that is cold and you don't see anything, you don't see outside, completely cut off. No daylight? Nothing. I remain there 70 days, continuous interrogation. What do you mean by continuous? That means I had three shifts of interrogators. Every day? Every day. Were you allowed to sleep at all? There is, between the night shift and the day shift, maybe two hours. I don't know, it's not long. I didn't, I didn't have any feeling for time, really. But what did it do to you? I lived in a haze. I was very... Uh, Nervous, very angry, very easy to be angry. And I was crying for the simplest reason. What else happened? They brought another Marine guy. He wore Marine. It does not mean that he's a Marine. I'm just saying this for the record. And then he kept pouring this water on me. Then I kept really shaking. He was pouring water on you? Yes. And then he said, answer me, but I couldn't talk because, because my mouth couldn't move, because I was very cold. You were just too cold to talk? Yes, I couldn't move my lips. 
But it was another tactic that brought Salahi close to the edge. An interrogator who claimed he'd been dispatched from the White House gave Salahi grave news. He was shown a fictitious letter stating that his mother had been detained and might be transferred to Guantanamo. There was no implication that she'd done anything? No, he said only because I wouldn't confess. The idea that she was going to be held with male prisoners was terrible for you? That is an understatement. What was your fear? I can't even think about it. I don't want to think about it. Later, he was dragged from his cell and put on a boat. They opened my mouth and pouring salt water until I start choking. They were forcing you to drink salt water? Yes. What happened next? So they start to uh, fill me with ice cube. Inside ice cube, your uniform? Inside my uniform. Ice cube, full. My body was full. And then I was like shaking uncontrollably like this. They start hitting me everywhere, hitting. Beating you? Yeah, beating me everywhere. For how long? Again, I didn't have feeling for a time, but it must have been three hours. How much pain were you in? I was moaning like a woman giving birth. And what did you decide to do? I decide I will tell them everything they want to know. They broke you? Absolutely. They broke me. I told the captain that the boss of my team, you write anything, and I signed it. And if you buy, I'm selling. And you were lying to them? And not everything I said lie. My life, I told them my life, truthfully. But the crimes, I was lying about every single crime I falsely confessed to. Salahi says he told his interrogators that he was an active recruiter for al-Qaeda and was involved in a plan for a bombing in Toronto. But that plot never actually existed. Your life got a lot better. Yes, dramatically better. No more beating. No more, I was allowed to sleep. I was afraid of conf false confessing, but it was a relief because now the captain could not torture me anymore because I gave him what he wanted. Now he had to sell this uh, first to the FBI, to CIA, and then they have to sell this to the prosecution, military prosecution. And those people are intelligent and smart. And then what they uh, pretty much told him, this is a bunch of BS. You told them what they wanted to hear because you wanted the torture to stop. Yes, absolutely. I falsely confessed to crime. It was bad business, bad business. In 2004, the military officer chosen to prosecute Salahi resigned from the case saying later that he was, quote, convinced that Salahi had been the victim of torture, not by anything Salahi said, but solely from US government documents from the intelligence databases, detailing specifically what had been done to him during the interrogations. In 2010, a federal judge ordered Salahi's release and wrote there is ample evidence that Salahi was subjected to extensive and severe mistreatment at Guantanamo. Evidence gathered through torture has complicated the government's military prosecutions at Guantanamo. There have only ever been eight convictions and three were later overturned. You were one of the worst tortured in Guantanamo, so you're in a unique position to answer this. Does torture work? In what way? That it, if it's if it working is bringing pain on me, yes. If uh, working is uh, giving false confessions, yes. If works is giving good intelligence, no. If it works resulting in my conviction, hello, I'm here after 15 years and not even charged, let alone being convicted. So how can you convince anyone possibly who has a shred of intelligence that it works? How did you manage to not lose your sanity? Thank you very much that the premise here that I did not lose my sanity. This psychiatrist told me 760, that's what they called me. 
you are really very sick. Sick with what? Psychologically. I was hearing noises. Hearing voices? Yes. What were they saying? It was my family just talking to me every day. And this wouldn't stop. And then it came to me, this doctor, and they helped me. They gave me medications over many years, heavy medication. And I was helped. They gave you psychiatric medicine? Yes. Taxol, clonopine, and you've seen Sopr the Sopranos? Yes. What did he take? Prozac. Ah. Things like that. They gave me a lot of this stuff. How's your health today? I don't have time to think about pain, which is good. The pain will go away. But you didn't really answer my question, Mohamedou. Are you dealing with psychological trauma? I'm not a doctor. Do you sometimes relive the torture in your head? Of course, I still have nightmares. I still wake up and I think I'm in Guantanamo Bay. At 46 years old, freedom has been a major adjustment. So has fame. He returned to Mauritania a national hero. Many here are angry about what the US, one of their allies, did to Salahi. But also proud that he's come home with his dignity intact. He's been embraced by a large extended family, including some members who weren't yet born when he disappeared. So he's been a, a, yes. a, a new discovery? Yeah, many, among many. So this is your mum's house? There have also been losses. It's been more than 15 years since he got in his car and headed to the police station on his way to Guantanamo. Salahi's mother said goodbye that night, but she wasn't there to welcome him home. She passed away in 2013. And you didn't see your mum again? No, I never saw her again. But the last time. It's, it, it's uh, seared in my memory, that picture froze in time. If you had to sum up the last 15 years of your life, what would you say? Pain and suffering is part of growing up, and I grew up. Mohamedou Salahi says the US government is holding several other books he wrote while in prison two novels and a self-help book about staying positive no matter the situation. At times during our trip to Mauritania, he seemed exhausted. Oh! But there was almost always a smile on his face. He told us getting out of Guantanamo was like being born again.